appreciation of the struggles and efforts of those who came before us, understanding and practicing the Quran and Sunnah as it was understood and practiced by the early generation of Muslim righteous Muslim scholars, and being flexible and tolerant of others who are following that path, or even of others who in ignorance have become rigidly bound to another path. We have to have some tolerance, tolerance in the sense of understanding what has happened, recognizing the error, but approaching its treatment in a way which would help to solve the problem, not a way which would, you know, increase the problem. Because it does no good to tell an individual who is blindly following a madhab that your faith is finished. You are out of Islam. <laughs> no. You may realize it. There may be factors which have led this person out of Islam because of what they do. But to tell them that is to close their ears. They are not going to listen to you after that. Rare person is going to listen to you after that. So this cannot be the approach. You know, we are advised to call to the way of Allah. Call to the way of your Lord, you know, with hikmah, with wisdom, understanding of people, their sensitivity, their psychology. And we should use good words, words which would, you know, bring them closer to us. Create love, concern, good feelings. Then, we may be able to convey the correct way to them. With that, you know, I will stop and uh, give you all now a chance to raise any questions you would like, particular to the topic. And those of you who had written questions, they can be sent to the front, you know, those who haven't been already sent. Sisters who have questions, should be some arrangement for somebody to collect those questions and bring them. And uh, we can also take direct questions from the brothers here who would like to raise their hands directly and uh, ask. So I'll give uh, first to somebody asking directly. Okay, but just, just one second. Uh, just you know, try to go through the questions and put those that are similar together so we don't have to talk about Well, I would say, brother, that whenever you have people saying things, you have to weigh what they're saying according to Quran and Sunnah. If you find a person who is talking, 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 or is writing, 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 and you don't see references to support his ideas in the Quran and the Sunnah, you know right away this is a dangerous person. <laughs> He's giving you his idea, purely. It's his mind, and you know the mind is, you know, is, is Allah has created it in such a way that everybody can have an opinion. No end of opinion. Right. So this is one of the signs, telltale signs of a deviant. One who's just talking, 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 no hadith, no Quran, just talking, talking, talking. Yes, this way, that way, it's just interpretation. So once you have somebody who's that way, they're talking all the time, you know that's a person who you should not be spending your time with. You go to find somebody who, every time he's talking, he says, oh, Quran, Allah said this, Sunnah, Hadith, yes, in Bukhari, Muslim, whatever. You know. This is uh, this is one of the ways that you can now filter out those who are giving you false information from, inshallah, those who are giving you correct information. That amongst those who are, you know, relying constantly giving you from the Quran and Sunnah, you choose one who seems to be the best qualified, you know, from the product of his studies, he spent a period of time studying and so and so, you know, one way or another, you know, not necessarily having gone overseas, but you know, having, you know, gathered a body of knowledge through his studies, uh, and that individual you can rely on to get the foundations of your faith, right? But, you don't sit only under that individual. 
If there are other, there will be others of similar backgrounds, you all put it under them. Wherever there are circles of learning, you go and you make your notes, you listen, and you always waiting Quran and Sunnah. This is what is right and wrong according to Quran and Sunnah. And inshallah you will find that those people who are who are on the correct path, giving you correct information, you'll find that their ideas will seem to mesh. They seem to agree. Whereas those that are on the other the other path, you'll see that, you know, it's always the here, the there. They may have something that is here, but it's mostly it's going out here, left and right, but, you know. And it'll become clearer and clearer to you. You know. But this is the process of seeking knowledge. You have to make some effort, some striving to get the correct information. And part of this you can do through your own personal study, reading from the Quran, by reading the Quran every day, you know, uh, exposing yourself to the message as it was revealed, or at least as far as you can get to it from the translation of the meaning, you know. This will create in you also a frame of mind, the Quranic frame of mind, you know, and reading also regularly from the Sunnah, from Bukhari and Muslim, main two collections which you know, are universally recognized amongst Muslim scholars as being you know, the most authentic collections reading from there, it will give you an overview. So you don't just go and you listen, 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 but you also do reading yourself. From the Quran, from the Sunnah that's available, it will become very clear to you quite rapidly. Who are really giving you solid information, who you can depend on, and those who you can't. But ultimately, you know, you have to depend on yourself. You should not think that, you know, you will approach the seeking of knowledge like a child with his mouth open and there's somebody with a spoon just pouring it down. You know, you open your mouth and there. No. You have to make effort. You have to strive to gain that knowledge. And then, inshallah, Allah will bless you with the correct knowledge. Well, you know, again, that's sort of more of history uh, to a certain degree in my book on the evolution of these, uh, six these factors have been identified. Uh, the fact is what we find which determine where and why a particular school of thought spread in a particular area, oftentimes it was because of certain political factors. A ruler of a given area chose a particular madhab, or he happened to be trained initially as a child from that madhab, and this became the school of thought for that area. Uh, or you found uh, certain schools of thought may have died out of the past because that scholar refused to become a, an appendage of the uh, sultanate or the leadership, you know, which liked in the past, in the period of time when the leadership had deviated. There was Islam, the mean Islam disappeared, but the leadership was not following Islam as it was prescribed by the Prophet Muhammad and demonstrated by his companions. It had taken another path, you know, which was more of a materialist, secular type of path. And of course, that type of leadership wants the scholars within its realm to submit to their particular way. So they may attempt to buy the scholars by bringing them under them, you know, into official bodies who will give rulings based on their own uh, positions, the positions of the, uh, the rulers. And you found scholars who refused. Those who refused were oftentimes jailed, sometimes killed, punished. Some had to go into hiding. So their, their school, or the, their students decreased, their writings disappeared, whatever. You know, think these schools became lost because of it. Not that the body of knowledge which the schools had was lost. No, this body is contained within the Sunnah. 
However, that particular school as a tradition of students who studied under this scholar, you know, died out. So there are a variety of different factors. The try to actually touch it for each of the schools and for each of the areas would take, you know, quite a long time. But be certain that, as to a large degree, the reasons for the spread of any given school of thought in any given area was more political than it was, in fact, uh, on the merit of the school in its being superior to other schools uh, based on its relationship to the Quran. Well, you know, in terms of Salaf, I mentioned this already. In terms of usage. And how such terms originated, like Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, is also added to it, and Salaf, these terms arose when there was a trend of deviation. When people started to make claims and practices which deviated from mainstream Islam, it was then necessary for the scholars of that time to separate themselves from those who had deviated. So the term Ahl Sunnah, meaning those who hung on to the Sunnah, evolved. And then even from that term, because everybody then started to say, well, we're Ahl Sunnah, in Jama'ah, you know, the term Salaf also became commonly used to distinguish between those who were following Quran and Sunnah, but not according to the interpretations and practice of the early generation of Muslims, but according to their own individual interpretation of their own period of time. You know, so these terms arose for that purpose. So we should not take them as labels, you know, that we carry around with us as a badge. You know, I am a Salafi. When I introduce myself, I am, you know, Brother Bilal Sunnah, the Salafi. You know, you know, this is what happened in the past, you know, when the Maghab fanaticism reached its peak, you know, each scholar of the time would be called, you know, so-and-so al Hanafi, so-and-so al Shafi. each one has this label after their name to identify their Maghab. So this is definitely not the way that we need to follow. We are so-and-so Muslim, you know, trying to follow Islam to the best of our ability. In the course of discussion, you know, it may come up with, you know, this, uh, we try to follow it according to the way of the Salaf, you know, as an, ex- as an explanation, not as a badge that we carry with us that we beat others over the head with, you know, you're not a Salafi, brother, you're off the path, you know, I'm a Salafi. No, this kind of approach is, of course, harmful. It does not convey the, the, the correct understanding which, you know, we need to have of the correct approach to the Quran and Sunnah, but in fact it, it creates further division amongst Muslims. Yeah, we have to give yeah, some written questions to chat. We often meet a group of people who recognize the Isna Ashari as Muslims and the Jafari school as legitimate. Then they go on to say we should unite with the Isna Ashari and establish the Khalifa, the Khilafa. He said, what should uh, we say to those people who make these claims? Well, when we talk about the Madhab or the schools of Islamic law, Within Islam, we are talking about the schools or the different madhab which hold as their foundation the Quran and Sunnah above all else. We're not talking about those who have put these aside and put their allegiances to other human beings who they feel were recipients of revelation and who were in fact infallible and as such worthy of following besides all else. So the so called Isna Ashriya, Jafri school of law, is not considered a part of mainstream Islam. It is it represents a deviation from mainstream Islam. And as such, we do not include it amongst the valid paths that one, may, as a Muslim, may follow while uh, being open-minded to 
take from any other school that is available from those of Ahl Sunnah. Because, as I said, these, this particular path, and this is not a statement on what is normally called Shiaism or Shiite as a whole. Because you have amongst them, for example, the Zaydi school, which is common in Yemen. And this school, as far as its positions of Islamic law, etc., are concerned, it is within the main body of Ahl Sunnah. But in particular groups, and as the brother mentioned here in the question, the Ibn Ashriya or the Ismailis, you know, or we have a variety of other Qadianis, you know, the variety of other groups which also claim that they are part of Islam. When we look at the foundations of their faith, we find in it a number of principles which go against the foundations of the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And just to be, it is just to briefly give an idea of what I'm speaking about in relationship to the Ibn Ashriya or the Twelvers, to translate it into English, the Twelvers, the Jafari school. We find in it, and this is in their own books which are studied, etc., a concept of a law which is different from what mainstream Islam understands of who Allah is. And because when we say we believe in Allah, we believe in the one God. This is not just a statement. It has behind it an understanding. That understanding must be in accordance with the teachings of Prophet Muhammad wasallam, as understood by his companions and the early generation of scholars. So, just as you have Christians who will say, we believe in one God, but what they mean by that one God is that a God has three aspects to him, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and you know, variety of other things. Yet they're still claiming one God. And if we go to the Hindus, we'll find the Hindus, the Hindu who knows his religion, not only the average Hindu, but the, the knowledgeable amongst the Hindus, they say, we believe in one God. I know normally Hinduism is not looked at as being a religion which believes in one God, but yes, they have an idea of one supreme being. But this one supreme being has become manifest amongst man in different forms, you know, different you know, human God forms. But they have this one. So the idea is not just a question of oneness, but how do you perceive that one? So now when we go into the teachings of the Twelve we find in there concepts about a law which are different, as I said, to that of mainstream Islam. For example, they hold that human beings, the twelve imams, as I mentioned, were infallible, incapable of committing any error. Now, we reject the Pope of the Catholics, because when he becomes a Pope, he becomes infallible according to him. We reject it. If we're going to reject that, how then can we accept some other human beings? to be infallible, not only when he became in this particular office, but as the, the, the Ibn Ashriya says, from the time they were born till the time they died, inwardly and outwardly, they made no errors, intentionally or unintentionally. This is Allah. This is Allah, who is totally free from error. So they, have now given one of the attributes of Allah to man. They also hold that the Imams were omniscient. They knew the past, the present, and the future. And this is in the writings of books which are in circulation amongst them. I'm not talking about some deviant amongst them, you know, they are deviants too, who wrote certain things and if they say, oh, this is a deviant idea. No, this is in the Basic books, followed by the main body of the national. And you go on from there, you will find a series of examples where the qualities of Allah have been invested in these individuals whom they refer to as the Twelve And this is their justification for following these individuals blindly. Because surely, if they had knowledge like Allah, they deserve to be followed. 
So, we cannot look at the Ithna Ashriya, the Jafari Madhab being a valid Madhab for Muslims to follow uh, and choose from the others, you know, freely uh, while following this particular Madhab because in its foundation it is in contradiction to the very Islamic concept of Allah Companions do. You know, what did the companions do? You know, those who were in Medina 
those who were in Iraq, those who were wherever they went. In terms of their interpretation, how did they put this statement of Prophet into practice? They looked into what the companions did. And this was the tradition which traditions which were handed down on to our time, which we consider to be, in general, the way, the general madhab of the early scholars of Islam. Now, in the Maliki madhab, Imam Malik, being from Medina, and not having ever left Medina except going to Hajj, his particular weight in his ruling, after Quran and Sunnah, that is the Hadith and Soto, after these two foundations, he also gave <coughs> credence or relevance to what was the common practice amongst the people of Medina. However, this was not a blanket position in that whenever he had a Hadith and he had the practice of the people of Medina, he would take the practice of the people of Medina and leave the Hadith. No. You will find by those scholars who have gone and tracked the rulings of Imam Malik on a variety of different positions, you will find times where he chose a hadith which went against the practice of the people of Medina. And uh, uh, sometimes when he chose the action of the people of Medina, which was also conveyed and related in hadith over certain other hadith. This was a position which uh, said Imam Malik took and utilized. Now, Imam Laik, Ibn Sa'd, was amongst the scholars of the time who challenged this position of Imam Malik, who rejected it. And the other leading scholars of Imam Malik's time rejected that position of Imam Malik as a valid uh, uh, approach to determining how the Sunnah should be applied. A number. I'm not saying all, but a number. So, when we approach Islam according to the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and Sunnah being that which is contained in the authentic traditions of the Prophet ﷺ, this particular approach is the madhab of the vast majority of early Muslim scholars till today. And I will say, you know, flatly yes, it was the madhab of that majority. And there was, as our brother pointed out, a madhab held by one segment of the main body of Muslims concerning the deeds of the people of Medina. However, I just want to emphasize this point, that even that position was not an absolute position, you know, as some people today would have us believe. Wherein, this is now held up as being the factor. Amal Ahl Medina. You know, it's the factor. And this has to be given consideration over Hadith in general. This was not really the position held by Imam Malik. Some individuals in our time have taken this position. And this is unique. Actually, this is something, this, this extreme attitude towards Amal Ahl Medina is something very recent among particular individuals who, to a large degree, have no credentials of scholarship in Islam, in the sense that they have, you know, studied the, 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 the Quran and the Hadith, you know, in their original languages, uh, studied the various disciplines that are con connected with them, but individuals who, you know, have taken a little bit from here and there and have created a particular problem for themselves and who use this banner of this Amal of Ali Medina as a means of distinguishing his followers or their followers from the main group of Muslims who attempt to follow the Quran and Sunnah according to the understanding of the early scholars of Islam. Uh, yes. Okay, the question was read. But I guess the, um, yeah. oh, this one, we're taking the question. Oh, that uh, right. See, let, let me just say, my brother, that, you know, I don't want to get into a one-on-one -on -one argument, okay? So, wait, 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 no, because 
What happens is that those people who have a particular issue or a particular point to raise on this, it would be better if they want to spend time on it. You know, we can squat, we can find separate time, we can squat and go into it in depth. You know, more and more in detail. Because I know, you know, you, know, you, you have only one of the points to bring on top of it just to check it out. But of course, when you do it, you're going to what we call open Pandora's box. And then I will be obliged to deal with some other point that you raise. And then, of course, you have another little point. And then, you know, so to avoid that, so that you, I let you express the view that you hold up, giving you my understanding from my side also. You know, and if we want to go into more depth, inshallah, we can set aside time where we can, you know, and I'll be glad to sit and, you know, discuss, you know, please. Okay, let's take a question from the sisters then first, and then we'll go back to one of them. There's a couple of questions here, somewhat related to each other. Uh, it is, um, how do we regard those who say we cannot trust hadith? Because A, they are the words of men, and B, the hadith has been tampered by Jews or pale Arabs, and uh, why can't we follow Dwight York? Isn't he following Islam? Okay, um, this uh, question... You know, involved dealing with the madhab, if we can call it that, of the answer. And actually, this is a whole topic in itself. Um, I have written also a book called The, uh, the Answer Cult in America, where the basic ideas and concepts held by uh, the answer, you know, have been presented from their own books, not from my head, but from their own books, and the Islamic position in relationship to them have, has been clarified. So for those who, you know, want to go into a, an in-depth understanding of these issues, it would be better to, you know, go back to that uh, book, to, and, and uh, if people would like to also discuss that, we could set aside another occasion to go into that in more depth. However, just uh, briefly, uh, to, to look at it in terms of uh, whether it was amongst the, the madhabs, we would have to say that in fact the Ansar cult is not amongst the madhabs of Islam. You know, like the, Sh- the, the Shiite not- group known as the Twelvers, they have deviated considerably in the very foundations of Islam from mainstream Islam. From the very concept of Allah through the concept of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, through all the various aspects of Islam, they have deviated. So they don't represent a valid uh, path that we may follow and then choose from the others. Uh, in fact, the issue that is mentioned about hadith being the words of men, you know, we can say that the Quran was handed down to us by the same people who handed down the hadith. So once you get into that, story about hadith being the words of men, then in fact you may be, you will be attacking the Quran itself. True, the authenticity, the effort which was made by early Muslims to maintain the integrity of the Quran was greater as a whole than that which was made in certain periods of time in relationship to the Sunnah. However, over time, great efforts were made to sifting out the inauthentic, unauthentic traditions which were attributed to Prophet from those which were authentic. And those which are classified as authentic now have been conveyed to us through that same chain which we consider to be authentic which has conveyed to us the Qur'an itself. So when one attacks the hadith saying it is the speakings of men, the speech of men, then one enters into attack on the Qur'an itself. And this is why you find <coughs> that Rashad Khalifa, the person who pr- promoted the idea of num- mathematical, numerical miracle in the Qur'an, he took the same approach and ended up attacking the Qur'an, claiming that there were false verses in the Qur'an. And the argument which he used for the 19 and, you know, the attack on the Sunnah <coughs> can be found in the literature of the so-called Ansarullah cult. So, do not be surprised if we find them also saying that some of the Qur'an that we have is not authentic. 
Do any of the four medhabs make it a point of Akhida to say that Allah is everywhere in heaven? Uh, today, we may find in the writings of the students of the various schools of thought this expressed the idea that Allah is everywhere. However, if we go back to the early scholars, to the so-called founders of these schools of thought themselves, they did not hold it. So I would not say that the belief that Allah is everywhere is the madhab or is a particular madhab amongst the four recognized present-day madhab. No, it was a philosophical madhab promoted initially by the Mu'tazilites and carried on by the what is known as the, the Ash'ari. They carried it on also. And because the Ash'ari school of thought became widespread amongst the Muslim Ummah, uh, this concept was now handed down in the writings of the scholars of the various schools of thought, of legal thought that we find today. So you will find basically from all of the various schools, you will find scholars today when they're writing concerning Allah and His attributes, etc., that uh, you may find many of them writing, you know, that Allah is everywhere. And of course, why this question was raised, was, was uh, brought up, was because of the fact that the early understanding, as taught by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the Quran, was that Allah is not in fact everywhere. But that Allah is above, is above the creation. Though He knows all things, sees all things, He's able to do all things which are consistent with His being Allah. Uh, this does not include Him being a part and parcel or within every portion of His creation. This is the position which we say is the uh, position of the early scholars of Islam. However, this has, this has, become, it has become in our times a minority position because of the influence of this uh, specific uh, philosophical school of thought which spread amongst the Muslim Ummah in a particular period of time in history. Uh-huh. <coughs> as, as point of Akhida, is it correct to be the punishment of the grave, the coming of the Mahdi, the coming of the Jazz, the descent of Isa and Mariam, or is it sufficient to say that we trust in the above but don't believe in it? He says, as point of Akhida, is it correct to believe in the punishment of the grave, the coming of al Mahdi, the coming of al Jazz, the descent of Isa ibn Mariam, or is it sufficient to say we trust in the above but don't believe in But don't believe in that sounds like a contradiction in terms. To trust in the above but don't believe in them. Uh, you know, if a person said, uh, because of the fact that he has come into Islam and his background on Islam is limited, and he said, well, you know, I, mean, I, I don't believe that uh, Prophet Isa is coming back again. Uh, this doesn't take him automatically out of Islam. I mean, based on the fact that he doesn't have a background. I mean, he, is then, he should then be brought to the Sunnah you know, the collections of Hadith, authentic traditions, where Prophet Muhammad is explained. Because truly, from the general text of the Quran, there is nothing that clearly and obviously speaks on this particular point. Uh, the clarity is given in the Sunnah itself. Uh, similarly, the issue of the Mahdi, this is not mentioned in the Quran. So, in issues, you know, which can only be found in the Sunnah, a person who, out of ignorance, limited knowledge, recently coming into Islam, etc., may make such statements. This doesn't, you know, we should not look at them as being deviant or less Islam. 